Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. On today's show, Donald Trump promises his billionaire donors more tax cuts and whiter immigrants. Joe Biden announces student debt relief for another 23 million people and finally gives BB Netanyahu an ultimatum. And later, Wisconsin Senator Tammy Baldwin stops by the studio to talk through her tough re-election campaign, TikTok, and what actually counts as milk. Yeah, what does count as milk? Stay tuned to find out. Is this a continuation of the Wisconsin trip I wasn't on? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Okay. Everything yeah, happened the great there. Yeah, yeah, the no, best was, trip we've a, ever been on. That was an incredible trip. The inside jokes from that trip <laughs> uh, that you don't we understand still talk about never it. stops. We still talk about it. Anyway, uh, but first, Trump said over the weekend that he'd finally be releasing a statement on abortion that was designed to, quote, win elections. That was in his post. Uh, and in a video posted on Monday, he again took credit for overturning Roe v. Wade and promised that his president... He'd let states pass even the most extreme abortion bans without any exceptions. Here's a clip. Many people have asked me what my position is on abortion and abortion rights, especially since I was proudly the person responsible for the ending of something that all legal scholars, both sides, wanted and in fact demanded be ended. Roe v. Wade. They wanted it ended. It must be remembered that the Democrats are the radical ones on this position because they support abortion up to and even beyond the ninth month. The concept of having an abortion in the later months and even execution after birth, and that's exactly what it is. The baby is born, the baby is executed after birth, is unacceptable, and almost everyone agrees with that. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks, or some will have more conservative than others, and that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. Just beautiful. Beautiful. <sighs> guy's, uh, guy's pretty sick. A little yeah. deranged. It's the... Uh... Also, uh, just a little all over the place at the end there. He's yes. reading, he, he's clearly was reading some of it from a, from a prompter, and he still couldn't fucking he's, get he reads the whole thing. Riffs. You it's can the tell. Most, it's the most... Um, when he has to do something like this, it's the most like a hostage he sounds. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's... Uh, deeply uncomfortable. So uh, Trump had been weighing a 15 or 16 week national ban, but ultimately decided that whatever that was, it's better politics. What do you guys think? Is he right? I think so. I think he's trying to muddy up an incredibly extreme, unpopular position on abortion. And he's betting that uh, this video will make someone the right angry, like Mike Pence, his former vice president, who angrily tweeted, I guess, or truth. I don't know what he does anymore. Whatever Pence does, he's mad about this. But um, Trump is betting the far right is going to turn out no matter what. And they'll at least get that he's winking here about his real position. I think the political challenge for Biden is that um, a lot of people believe the Trump persona from the apprentice days. They don't believe that he's personally opposed to abortion, especially low education swing voters don't necessarily know that he's the reason Roe versus Wade was overturned. So I, I think this is the right political bet. What do you think, Levitt? Yeah, I think that's right. I also think he's banking on the fact that the statement is going to be covered at face value. Yes. Uh, A, it's going to be covered as if the position he's taking is a position he will continue to hold. Or B, that you can even accept this characterization of what he's saying. Because there's nothing in his statement that actually says, I oppose or I will not sign a national abortion. Correct. There's nothing. Correct. There's nothing in it that precludes... You know, if he were if he were to end up signing a national abortion ban, there are people that say he's changing, that he's going against his word. He has not given his word. He has made no promise to not do what he, everyone expects him to do, which is sign a national abortion ban. Yeah, you say if Congress passes a federal ban, will you veto it? Honestly, he, question. he didn't say much new. Right. Yeah. For all the build up to this, it wasn't much new. So I think it was it was better politics than him endorsing a fifteen or sixteen week ban. But I still think better politics isn't necessarily good politics. Like, I do not think he has solved his problem at all here. He still hasn't answered, will he sign a national abortion ban if it comes to his desk? He still has not answered the question, as a Florida resident, is he going to vote to keep the six-week ban in Florida? And the big one, will he ban abortion medication? Um, A lot of his uh, goons have been telling reporters that they want him to... uh, uh, invoke the Comstock Act 
and which would ban medication abortion. A law uh, from 1873. From 1873. And of course, two thirds of abortions are uh, through abortion medication. The, the Texas Solicitor General who designed their state's ban uh, said it went to Politico at one point, we don't need a federal ban when we have Comstock. Uh, so you have to, to, to believe that Donald Trump is not going to further restrict abortion, you would have to believe that even though he uh, filled his administration with fundamentalist right-wing kooks last time around, that he's not going to do it this time around, and now that Dobbs has been decided, that they're not going to just decide to do what they want to do and have wanted to do for a long time, which is use the federal government to ban medication uh, abortion that you that you can send through the mail. I mean, okay. If you yeah, want to believe that, that's fine. By the way, it's going to be the same kooks. It's not a big new group of kooks. Worse kooks. I would say Somewhere, there's more worse there'll be, kooks. There'll be, there'll be more and worse kooks, but the same people that help put together the plan to promote the judges and, and write the executive actions to do everything they could to restrict or overturn or ban abortion will be the same people that come in next time. The Heritage Foundation had this report, the 2025 project. And in it, they talk about how the next conservative administration has to obviously sign a national abortion ban if they can get it through Congress. But even if they can't, yes, they want to go after Mifa Pristone. But there was a part that I, I went through it and I just looked through all the parts. First of all, this thing is fucking insane. Uh, just one sentence is just I, I happened upon by accident. It's like 500 pages. Pornography should be outlawed. The people who produce and distribute it should be imprisoned. Just kind of off huh. the, just kind of in there. Good Oof. to know. Uh, but uh, one one part of it says the FDA, this is about Mifepristone. The FDA is statutorily charged with guaranteeing the safety and efficacy of drugs and therefore should be therefore should withdraw this drug, Mifepristone, that is proven to be dangerous to women and by definition fatally unsafe for unborn children. And that is their logic that no abortion drug can be definitionally safe, right? That means any kind of abortion treatment, anything, any kind of care that could lead uh, uh, to an abortion would be something that the FDA would try to overturn. And so there could be no technical ban on the books in California, but they will go bit by bit through every single way that a person accesses abortion care and make sure that that is inaccessible or punishable uh, or, or criminalized. Yeah. And then there are the steps uh, that would land a national abortion ban on his desk. If Donald Trump wins the presidency, uh, it is virtually guaranteed that Republicans will have the Senate. Uh, it is yeah. pretty likely that Republicans will have the House. If they get the House, it'll easily pass through the House or an abortion ban. The Senate, I do think, is, is, is a, more of a challenge because if they have 51 votes, yes, they could get rid of the filibuster to pass one, but they probably don't have Collins and Murkowski for an abortion ban, but they could still have 53, 54 seats, right? If Donald Trump wins. And then, so then imagine the, the Republican, a Republican House passing a ban and a Senate, Republican Senate passing a ban, and then it getting to Donald Trump's desk, Donald Trump, who does not have to face voters again. Right. We good. think he's going to be like, no, 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 no. This, I'm going to, I'm going to veto at this point. He's going to sign on. it. Um, so Biden responded to saying Trump is uh, responsible more than anyone in America for the cruelty and chaos unleashed by Dobbs. And uh, Biden promised to make the freedom to choose the law of the land if he's elected with a Democratic Congress. Uh, here's a clip. Donald Trump just endorsed every single state ban on reproductive care nationwide. All across the country, women are being turned away from emergency rooms or being forced to travel hundreds of miles or ask a judge just to get the basic care they need. That's Donald Trump's vision for this country. He said it himself. He punished women who seek out the care they need. If MAGA Republicans put a federal ban on his desk, he'd sign it. Donald Trump is the reason Rose ended. If you reelect me, I'll be the reason why it's restored. Uh, campaign's also out with an absolutely gutting uh, new ad about a woman from Texas who nearly died twice after she was denied care for a miscarriage because of the state's abortion ban. Um, what did you guys think of the the Biden campaign response, which has really been uh, pretty f full-throated and been happening all day. They've had surrogates out, they've got ads, they've got the president out, they had the vice president out. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think they understand that this is one of the most important ways that they're going to defeat Donald Trump and they're not going to let him get, get away with this statement. And they're really going to not, and what's I think really important about it is they're not going to let it be reported at face value. They're going to make sure that they're in the story calling him a fucking liar, which he is, but also pointing out all the ways in which he's responsible for, for Roe being overturned. The ways in which Roe being overturned doesn't just affect people who need abortions, but affects people who need all kinds of medical care. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad that they jumped all over this. I mean, I, I too was a little disappointed with how credulous the reporting was, yeah. uh, at least the first round of it on this video. I think Biden did a good job of being clear what he would do 
I think we need to push back even more on this disgusting claim that Democrats want to kill infants after they're born. I mean, that is murder. It is illegal even in blue states. It's outrageous. That doesn't happen. It never happened. Uh, but it's a Trump talking point. Um, but I do think the, the ad that you're talking about is um, those kind of stories will do the most to influence opinion. But Biden in his statement, I mean, I think his point is going to be, look what Trump did, not what he says. That's all you need to know. Make this broader argument about it's not just Trump that will get elected. It's this right wing extremist crop of zealots uh, in his coalition that wants a national abortion ban. And then I think you have to point out the inconsistencies, which is Trump can say that he's for uh, certain exception, exceptions for the life and health of the mother or for rape or incest. But if he's OK with these extreme state by state bans, that completely undercuts that position. Yeah. And I thought the, the Biden campaign just uh, has been tweeting out like state by state some of the most heinous extreme bans. And now Trump owns all of those bans. There is a, there's a little bit of like people trying to convince Democrats trying to convince people like this is what Trump would really do. This is what's in his mind. He's lying. And like, do I think he's a liar? Yeah, of course. But we don't have to convince people of that. We don't have to exaggerate much here. All you have to do is exactly uh, what he's already done what Tommy was just saying, and he owns every single ban that is currently in place right now. Including his home state. Yeah. Well, I would also say, you know, he actually doesn't say health of the mother. He says life of the mother, which there's a lot of reasons a person would need an abortion because of their health. One being that they would like to have children in the future. Right. uh, That this doesn't provide an exemption for. The other thing is, you know, I think sometimes Trump, uh, (laughs) Trump gets exempt from normal politics because he's crazy. uh, And then... Uh, when he's normal, gets gets exempt from normal politics because he's crazy. And I, and like in this case, like treat him like a normal politician. Like John, you mentioned this. Florida voters will have the opportunity to either protect abortion access in Florida, or basically approve a six week ban. No, there's no 15 weeks. There's no oh, we're gonna find the perfect thing. He's gonna have a he is gonna have a very simple choice for the next year that will be ahead of him whether he would be in favor of a six week ban or protections. It's an either or, and he should just be hammered on that until he provides an answer because I don't think, I I assume he's going to avoid answering for as long as he possibly can. And medication abortion is popular among Republicans. You know, this is like very early. It's an 80, 20 issue. Yeah. It's used in early stages of pregnancy. It's 60% of abortions, medication abortion. I mean, there's some weirdness on the numbers when you talk about whether uh, people approve it getting shipped over state lines, I think because the polling was bad more than anything, but it's a very popular uh, path for people. Yeah. And you can, you know, you can debate what he's going to do, what he might do, what he has done this ban, this many weeks. But I think him owning what has already happened proudly, as he said in the video, and then watching an ad like that from the Biden campaign for most voters, that's how this is going to land this debate. And by the way, we're going to get another cycle. Like he's going to be asked the next time he does any kind of a mainstream interview, like, does this mean you're going to veto a national abortion ban? And yep. he is going to fump for, I mean, who knows what he's going to say, but that is going to be the next round of this. Hopefully we'll get it on the right wing interviews too. Yeah. You know, I know yeah. Hugh Hewitt doesn't have a spine, but eventually he'll talk to like a, you know, some Christian outlet or something. You know what he's going to say? He's going to say, I'm going to, but before he even gets that, I'm going to bring both sides together. We're going to make everyone very happy. Yeah, he just lies. So you would sign up. So you would sign up, man. We're going to make, we're going to make everyone very happy. Look, you know what I did? I killed Roe versus so, Wade. Everyone wanted me to. Anyway. Uh, yeah. I've anyway, been. have you seen the eclipse? <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful, um, beautiful eclipse. <laughs> so uh, Trump also hosted a big fundraiser in Palm Beach over the weekend with some of the worst billionaires on the planet. People who profited off of the subprime mortgage crisis, compared higher taxes to the Holocaust, and opposed the Civil Rights Act, just to name a few. I mean, John, just be careful, because for, for two of those, they could be our billionaires, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. The one that the, high, Steve, the higher taxes to the Holocaust one, that was, uh, I believe that was Steve Schwartzman. Uh, Was that Steve Schwartzman? I don't know. Anyway, forget that. Um, Trump promised the billionaires more tax cuts, said he only wants immigrants from, quote, nice countries like Denmark and Norway, uh, and accused Joe Biden of pooping on the Resolute desk. Did you guys catch that one? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, I didn't catch that one, (laughs) but I read the story. You read the story? Yeah. Yeah. The campaign claims that the event raised $50 million, which would be double what Biden raised in New York the other week. Uh, lots to unpack there, starting with the money. You guys buy the $50 million number? Uh, here's how I feel about this. Do I believe they would lie to say it's double, say it's double? Oh, we doubled it, we doubled it. Absolutely. Do I also believe that 
a group of uh, the country's absolute fucking worst billionaires would get, get together to give $50 million to the guy whose only legislative accomplishment is cutting their taxes? Yes, I believe that as well. So I'm really open. Yeah. I'm really open. My mind is open. We will not know for sure until we see the campaign finance reports, but it's possible. So remember, they're raising money for the Trump 47 Committee, which is a joint fundraising account that goes to the Trump campaign, the RNC, state parties, and Trump super PAC. So that committee can accept a check up to uh, $824,600 per person. So is it possible that they found 60 billionaires like the ones Love had just described and said, write the max? Possible. I mean, one person I talked to said they heard this event was all the low hanging fruit for Trump. Uh, <laughs> and like you said, this is like, you know, they view this as an investment. Yeah. In a future tax cut, it's low not a donation. F- that's a lot of low hanging fruit. I mean, there's it's a not lot that of hard to find fruit in that room. Like super rich people to write you a big check. <laughs> but it's also possible that they're just screwing with the accounting and that a big chunk of what they're reporting was super PAC donations, which can take unlimited money from whomever. And uh, and also, by the way, that will end up paying Trump's legal bills. So the Biden campaign thinks that they're reporting a bunch of super PAC money and that this is just an apples to orange is comparison with his event in New York. Can I just say one more thing on this? If. <laughs> If they want to lie about raising $50 million from some of the worst That's billionaires the in the part. country who he then just promised a whole bunch, like another trillion dollars worth of tax cuts to, go for it. I would, <laughs> I would like you gladly want, cede the title like, of what? big money campaign Wait, I don't, to Trump. I don't know why we get into this strange. thing where it's like, oh, the Biden is $25 million. Oh, it's double. We're more than you. Like, no, no. But raising a lot of money like this is a necessary evil in politics. Who the fuck cares who raised more? Well, I, I we, just need a, we just need a well-funded campaign to run a bunch of ads and beat Donald Trump. Yeah, I, mean, I think we they need. were doing the kind of, they did the $25 million number to show like, look at the strength of this thing. We're going to go into good, the, but at a yeah. time when the polling, number, polling wasn't great. Uh, this is just like, Trump double. We double. <laughs> yeah. You bad. We we double your yeah. old shit on desk. We double. You can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that is. You can certainly imagine Trump reading the twenty-five million dollar headlines and saying, "We need to double this. Figure out how to make it happen." And yeah. also, like you know, it could it could be donations that have been coming in for a long time. Exactly. It could be a bunch of earmark things. things for this event. It seems to me like tax cut for billionaires and uh, and white immigrants only isn't the uh, isn't the message to win over those swing voters, but. Uh, Maybe some of these voters are cross pressured uh, by their opposition to Joe Biden shitting in the Oval. I don't know. What do you guys think? LBJ famously uh, took meetings on the toilet. So the mountain mm. comes to Muhammad and with, with <laughs> well, right. Hustle culture has gotten pretty bad. So maybe you're just <laughs> sort of skipping a step here and being even more efficient. Just reading the words in the New York Times, just throwing it out there. Uh, Trump was referring to uh, when asked attend when asked uh, when we asked attendees, uh, they said he was referring to Biden actually defecating on the desk. Because when I Glad first saw clarified. it, I assumed it was fake news. <laughs> Meticulous I, reporting. I assumed oh. just I assumed it was fake news. I assumed that people were misreporting a Trump ridiculous statement that he was saying. You think just, it was just a Friday news dump? I, th- <laughs> <Jesus Christ. laughs> I did the usual the usual DC <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> but uh, but that no. What I thought is I thought it was good, that that he was saying Biden is so old he's soiling himself at the desk. But mm. then you look at the text and he says I don't even want to touch the desk. Right. So then it's like oh so it's now it's on the desk. Here's I don't know if he put a lot of thought into it. Maybe just right. one up. He's just riffing. Tape thing. He's just riffing. He's just riffing. He's just looking for stuff. Yeah, that's Seeing right. Seeing what works. Today's presenting sponsor is Simply Safe Home Security. Deadlines almost here. Have you done your taxes yet? The only thing more terrifying than doing your taxes is a break in or fire. That's why we recommend Simply Safe. It's advanced protection powered by 24-7 professional monitoring for less than $1 a day. Here are a few more reasons why we recommend it. I set up a Simply Safe system. It's incredibly easy to do, works right out of the box. You can customize it for your home and the app works really well. Highly recommend it. It's trusted by experts. Simply Safe was named Best Home Security System for 2024 by U.S. News and World Report. And Newsweek awarded it Best Customer Service in Home Security. The system blankets your whole home in protection. It has sensors to detect break-ins fires, floods, and more, plus a variety of indoor and outdoor cameras to keep watch over your property day and night. Simply Safe professional monitoring agents can even help stop crime in real time by speaking to intruders through the wireless indoor camera, warning them that they are being recorded and police are on the way with no contract and a 60-day money-back guarantee. You can try Simply Safe risk-free. Don't absolutely love it? Send the system back for a full refund. Protect your home today. Our listeners get a special 20% off any new Simply Safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com/crooked. That's simplysafe.com/crooked. There's no safe like Simply Safe. 
Uh, all right. So uh, speaking of the president, when he's not pooping at his desk, he was in Wisconsin Monday, where he announced a new plan to provide debt relief to more than 23 million people who are still paying off their student loans. Ever since Republicans in Congress and the Supreme Court blocked Biden's earlier plans to provide debt relief, the administration has been able to use its existing legal authority to help more than four million Americans. The plan he announced this week would obviously be a much bigger deal, up to 23 million people. Uh, here's the president talking about it. Today, I'm proud to announce five major actions to continue to relieve student debt for more than 30 million Americans since this, I started my administration. And starting this fall, we plan to deliver up to $20,000 in interest relief to over 20 million borrowers and full forgiveness for millions more. So the question with all these Biden student debt plans is, can he actually get it done without it getting blocked? And uh, who does it help? Uh, what do you guys think? I hope we can get the checks out before Clarence Thomas gets back from Bora Bora. <laughs> Just get those checks out. We got an election to win here. Hopefully, there's no clawback provision. I, you know, I remember the first round of this. I they was said like, early fall. They think they'll be uh, able to, uh, the first time. I, the first time we went through this round of student debt, I remember like reading carefully about like the the, re, the rationalizations and all the reasons and the different ways he could like kind of structure the thing. Now I'm just like fucking get the checks out. We got to win. I don't care. Get the kids some money. And this one's hard because obviously in the first round, President Biden was pushed very hard by progressives to cancel student debt. He was concerned that it might get struck down in the courts, which is why he has for a while. Then he put forward what was actually a more generous plan in a lot of ways than I think people were expecting. Then the court struck it down and then everyone was like, God damn it, Biden. Yeah, then some so, progressives were like, what's wrong with you? You should have just used another law somewhere and found it and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I mean, I think- <laughs> Well, maybe know, that's what he did. <laughs> so, well, what they've done is, you know, they've they've tried some creative approaches that they've, as you said, they think they've provided nearly 150 billion in student debt relief, despite the Supreme Court ruling. So they're trying another path. They know they're going to get sued. I mean, we talked to them and they said, well, yes, we know we're going to get sued. But I think the idea is to get caught trying here and make clear this time that the Republicans are the ones blocking him, not President Biden blocking student debt from getting canceled. And I mean, they did have their lawyers go back and look and see like what could be more feasible to do, right? So this is a different, this is all according to the Washington Post, this is a different law. They had the, tw the 2003 Heroes Act is what they tried the first time it got struck down. This is based on the authority they have in the 1965 Higher Education Act, and um, which allows the education secretary to, secretary to compromise, waive, or release loans under certain circumstances. Um, so in, the, in this instance, uh, there, there's four groups of people who would be helped by this. So they would wipe away some or all of the interest on loans that have become bigger than what was originally borrowed. Um, also cancel debt for people who do qualify for some existing student loan relief programs, but just haven't applied yet. So they would yeah. just cancel it for them. Um, people who are still paying off their loans 20 years uh, after they took them out or 25 years for graduate degrees. And then they are uh, creating a special hardship program. So if you also have high medical debt or childcare or something like that, then you can apply and potentially get a waiver. So they do seem like they're not like this blunt force. Everyone gets student debt relief that a court could easily, I mean, the court could still strike it down, but it, you can see where they're trying to yes. find. Yeah. I, the other, the other instance specifically is if you got uh, convinced to go to a school that lost mm. his accreditation, like one of these junk for-profit schools, but you still have a huge debt uh, and no diploma anymore, they will cancel that debt too. Yeah, yeah. That I makes mean, like, a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, where I'm, where I'm at with all this is like, okay, like I, I think it's great. I think we should be doing everything we can to fulfill the promise of canceling student debt. Go through the law books, find some fucking thing, get the lawyers in there with, I don't know, microfiche? Probably not. And just like find ways to do this, fine. But like, we do like, uh, the idea that like the way the government now works is Congress does nothing and then administrative lawyers like comb through the books to find various little rules they can abuse to do the things like, OK, I guess that's that's the world we're going to live under. That's what we did for DACA. That works. I, Pen in the phone. Come on. That's what look, that's what like, look, DACA was a way to get around the fact that Congress wouldn't do anything on immigration. These are all ways in which admit the administration is basically legislating. I'm for it. I think we should do it. I think we should do as much as we possibly can as long as we have a completely fucking useless and feckless Congress. But it is like an it is like in the long term, like we have accrued more and more power to to the to the White House, and then these presidential elections feel like the stakes are total because they are, and like uh, that's all. Yeah, I just think there's I think there's also a lot of gray area in some of these laws that are open to interpretation, right? Sure. Like I don't think it's obvious. All sure, the time. but like, do I think that whatever law they're using was written so that 
decades later, the president could go through and wipe away vast swaths of student loan debt? Probably not. I don't care. Go for it. Do it and be legends. But <laughs> we'll see. We'll what see. A, what, a, what a country. Uh, the president has also been making news on one of his biggest challenges with young and progressive voters, the war in Gaza. Last week, after an Israeli strike killed seven aid workers from Jose Andres' World Central Kitchen, Biden finally told Netanyahu that if Israel doesn't change course by immediately announcing steps to, quote, address civilian harm, humanitarian suffering, and the safety of aid workers, that, quote, we won't be able to support you. That last quote is from an Axios report on the call. Uh, Bibi responded by finally allowing more humanitarian aid into Gaza, where millions are suffering, many on the verge of famine. Uh, Biden hasn't specified what the consequences will be if Netanyahu doesn't do more, but uh, conditioning military aid is presumably now on the table. This comes as more Democratic politicians and voters well beyond the progressive base have criticized Biden's Gaza policy. Uh, Tim Kaine applauded Biden for the move, but said, quote, this was an obvious solution that should have happened months ago. Uh, Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland said that it shows, quote, when the president uses leverage to enforce his demands, he gets results, but that we will, quote, look feckless if we do not match our words with deeds. Uh, seems right to me. What about you guys? Do you think this could be a turning point? I hope so. I mean, in the near term, uh, 419 aid trucks got into Gaza on Monday. 322 aid trucks got in on Sunday. In February, the average per day was 98 trucks. So there's two highest been, totals since October 7th. So there's been an impact. That's that increase is good. Uh, also, it proves that the slowdown in the previous months was the entirely the result of a policy choice made by the Israeli government, not other complications that you saw blamed in the media. Uh, it's also gross that it took the death of seven Western aid workers to get here. But, you know, I'm glad we're here. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. It's long overdue. I think the next step is getting a ceasefire agreement. That gets more complicated because it's a negotiation that involves Hamas to secure the release of these remaining hostages, um, at least the ones that are still alive. And uh, But the negotiators were reportedly mad that Netanyahu was not giving them enough flexibility Biden pushed him on that, too. So we'll see if that uh, gets things moving. And then there's the question of Rafa, which is that city in southern Gaza where there's like a million people sheltering. Uh, the U.S. position is that the Israeli military should not launch an invasion into Rafa, at least until they get a plan into, to, that shows how they'll protect civilians. Uh, the U.S. has said they're yet to see such a plan. But Netanyahu today or Monday said that he has set a date for a Rafa invasion. And he keeps saying things like, we're in the middle of this war. So I do hope the message is, no, we're not. We're at the end of this war uh, and you need to end it. The problem, though, is politically Netanyahu sees this war as a lifeline. And he is worried that he will you know, face elections once it's over, that his party will get destroyed. He will lose power uh, and then face a bunch of corruption charges. So that's the long term complicating factor that makes all of this harder going forward. I do think that the politics at home at here for Biden have changed pretty significantly in that you have, I mean, you have all kinds of people criticizing him for his Gaza policy, including, according to the New York Times and other reports, like Jill Biden. Chris Coons. <laughs> yeah. Like his wife has yes. been saying, Joe, this needs to end. Um, and so, I, and it is, it, it was amazing and also just like really frustrating to see that like he does one call to BB where he finally gives him an ultimatum, and then immediately see the aid truck start going into Gaza. And it's yeah. like, well, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how the, the people who were who were defended the like, you know, the hug, uh, BB, the strategy. hug BB strategy in private and he's got to maintain his leverage. It's like, well, well, then well, it was self-evidently stupid from the beginning. And by the way, also the people that defended the 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 claim that Israel couldn't get aid in. For weeks and weeks on right. end, that was wrong. and then also, by the way, on the other, on, uh, the second Biden does shows just <laughs> puts puts the puts like real pressure on Netanyahu in this call. Republicans immediately put forward a resolution to say that he's being uh, insufficiently pro-Israel. Right. Yeah, that's gonna, he's going to deal with that. I mean, I've heard a lot of people like cast doubt on whether this is a real political problem for Biden. Certainly, the polls now show that his Gaza policy is unpopular with a majority of voters. Sending more weapons is unpopular too. Right. Yeah. Now, whether whether voters' opposition to his Gaza policy is a deal breaker for them is still unclear, but I would say two things. Like one, in a rematch against a guy you beat by only 40,000 votes last time, 
every single thing matters. And also, it's like beyond the politics. Like, I just haven't heard a moral case or any case at all for like why the only way to dismantle a terrorist organization and and free hostages is to uh you know killing it is to kill and starve tens and tens of thousands of people including children and and, and babies it's because there is no case right this, this <laughs> war is a moral strategic and political disaster the the morality of it is the death toll the number of children who've been killed using starvation as a tool of war but then strategically uh even the Israeli military intelligence services do not believe that you can defeat Hamas entirely. They will exist as a terrorist organization, as a guerrilla organization. They're not going to go away. You can you can diminish their capabilities and reduce the threat, but you cannot kill off the organization or kill an idea or a resistance to occupation. So they're not going anywhere. And I worry that a generation of young people are being radicalized and that that radicalization is not just going to be pointed at the Israeli government. It's going to be pointed directly at us. And you're seeing this thing metastasize into the Middle East. You're seeing the Israelis bombing Iranian generals in a diplomatic facility in Damascus. Now we're all waiting to see what the Iranian response is and whether they're going to fucking attack Israel directly or attack some U.S. interests in the region. Like nothing about this is making anyone safer. It is all just getting worse. You know what really drives me nuts is people who are like, well, no one's calling on Hamas to just release the hostages. Hamas could end this war tomorrow. It's like, of course they Hamas, could, but... Hamas being murderous monsters <laughs> who use their own people as human shields, like that that doesn't absolve the Israelis or any of us from like our duty to protect people and to like think about the consequences that you just laid out of carrying on this war. Of course they're like murderous terrorists. We get that. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, you can't spend six months running all the civilians into one city and then bomb that city it, it, the, just the, simply I mean, it, there's no it's not not complicated the calling on hamas argument frustrates me so much because <laughs> everyone is calling on hamas to release the hostages I guess, I, they have been since the very beginning they're holding innocent civilians everyone wanted them to release the hostages the u.s doesn't have diplomatic relations with hamas we don't talk directly with hamas we talk to hamas through intermediaries like qatar or egypt or other countries right so we don't even have a relationship with them so there's no leverage there we have leverage with the israeli government we can shift as we just saw the way they prosecute this war and that's what everyone's been looking for netanyahu after october 7th had bad options and worse options and he chose the worst of all options which is this war and this death toll and starvation as a tool of war and this disastrous situation we're now in. And by the way, he's facing massive protests inside of Israel. You're starting to see big protests in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem. You're seeing uh, former hostages who have been released calling on him to do more. You're seeing the families of hostages. I mean, the real question is how many of these hostages are alive at this point? And I don't say that to blame Netanyahu or, or the government. But again, like the only time hostages have gotten back is through a negotiated ceasefire, temporary ceasefire between the two sides. And I think that's what everyone's been looking for. You saw... Netanyahu today, well, recording is Monday, once again said we, there's a date for when we're going to go into Rafa. How? I mean, obviously he intends to do that, but he's also negotiating. Yeah, he. I mean, look, there's. You could. I wonder if he's using that to put political pressure on Hamas, but I don't know. Are they feeling political pressure at this point? I, I, I've like I can't. We have no read on what they think. Yeah. You know, even the negotiations that are happening in Qatar are like with some political operatives that don't even live in the Gaza Strip. Most of the time, they negotiate with the U.S. and Israel and Egypt. Then they try to pass a message into Gaza to get it to Yaga Sinwar, who's sitting in a tunnel somewhere hiding out. And it's like, I see are the people in Qatar really speaking for him, the military leaders on the ground. We just don't really know. Well, I wish it had happened uh, a lot sooner, but I'm, Me too. I'm really glad that Joe Biden made that call. Bibi Netanyahu is a bad guy. Like, I, like again, th there are not great options here for Biden or for the Israelis after October 7th, but Netanyahu is a bad person, a bad leader, and he should not have been given this much rope. Yep. Uh, before we go to break, I uh, thought we'd just talk about maybe some other quick stories everyone mm -hmm. should be paying attention to. Uh, I noticed today, first of all, RFK Jr.'s campaign, what a fucking mess. It's a juggernaut. <laughs> it's <laughs> he's a real mess. So there's first, going great. first there was something on Friday where he released a full statement about the, uh, the January 6th 
rioters, okay, uh, insurrectionists, and basically was like, I have not examined the evidence in detail. It's always great when you put that out in your statement, uh, even though the evidence is there for all to see. And yeah, it was been on for television. Very long right, it was on time. television, yeah. yeah. Famously, Famously on television, Trump watched uh, it, remember? Said, but reasonable people tell me there is little evidence of a true insurrection. They observed that the protesters carried no weapons. Then he promised to appoint a special counsel to investigate the prosecutors instead of the people who pleaded guilty or were convicted by a jury of their peers for violently assaulting police officers then when everyone pointed out to rfk jr in his campaign that actually they carried a lot of different kinds of weapons uh flagpoles mace explosives all the kinds of stuff he goes oh yeah yeah i, I was told there actually were weapons <laughs> so that was great and then uh the campaign's new york director uh, was caught on video talking to some supporters and and said the following she said the kennedy and trump voter our mutual enemy is Biden. If nobody gets 270, Congress picks the president. So who are they going to pick if it's in a Republican Congress? They'll pick Trump. So <laughs> a little quiet part out loud. But, there. but it doesn't actually make it. I can't. How does it make sense? Because like, I like the idea that there's Kennedy people out there being like, it's Trump and Kennedy versus Biden. That's great. Keep doing <laughs> that. But you still have to get electoral votes. So so what are we talking about here? I think they're just I think what she was saying is like the most important thing is to make sure that Joe Biden doesn't become president. And obviously we'd love if RFK Jr. becomes president, but you know, on the on the on the chance that he's not going to be, we'll get Trump. But there's another guy that hates vaccines up there. <laughs> Donald Trump. I mean, that's probably right. the rest no, of her sentence. Yeah. It's a uh, what a fucking dilettante. It's just like <laughs> it's just unbelievable. It's just this like this is blundering go oaf running around making absolutely no sense. The uh but but like again, like for RFK to help Donald Trump by throwing it to Congress, he would have to get an electoral vote. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they, mean they, uh, they believe all kinds of crazy things. I'm sure they think. Was he going to do great in Omaha? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, I maybe don't that's get it. it. Maybe, maybe it's, it's all. Weird. Maybe it's an Omaha play. Yeah. Uh, one other uh, story worth watching. So this is a very weird one. So the, this is about the Montana Senate race. So there's a, a Republican named Tim Sheehy. He's running for Senate in Montana against John Tester. He's a former Navy SEAL. Uh, he apparently at some point in his life he got shot. Uh, and he still has a bullet lodged in his arm. Over the years, the story about how that bullet got into his arm has changed. Uh, he uh, once said that the bullet was from his time in Afghanistan when he was serving uh, in the U.S. military. Other times he says he accidentally shot himself during a visit to Glacier National Park in Montana. He dropped his gun, it discharged, the bullet went into his arm, whatever. So both these stories are on the public record. The Washington Post was like, hey, what, what's the deal with this discrepancy? So she, he says, oh, actually, I lied about shooting myself by accident at Glacier National Park. The real story is I fell. I hurt myself on a hike. I had to go to the ER. Someone was like, what's up with that bullet in your arm? And he said, uh, then he had to talk to a park ranger. So he lied to the park ranger and said, I shot myself because he wanted to avoid an investigation into the shooting in Afghanistan because he never reported it and didn't want to get his buddies in trouble. Now... <laughs> That's weird on a number of levels. One might imagine that an ER doctor would notice the difference between a bullet wound from that day <laughs> and one from a few years ago. That's one area where it seems to fall apart. Um, he also previously said that he was shot multiple times in, in Afghanistan. His book, he said he was shot multiple times. So who knows where, the, look, if he was a Democrat, you'd have swift boat veterans for truth, you know, chasing him out of the state as we speak because he's a Republican. First thing that popped into my mind is who like, knows? John Kerry, John yes. Kerry. Yes, who knows how <laughs> Shouldn't this have thrown that medal. <laughs> but um, what a weird story. That is strange. That is strange. Because I think if I shot myself in the arm, I would lie and say it happened in combat, but I wouldn't make up multiple wounds. You wouldn't make up a lamer story. No, you wouldn't go worse with it. You wouldn't <laughs> go pay worse a fine. with it. Uh, really weird. Shout out uh, Washington Post, Liz Goodwin. Great story. And also... Go donate some money to John Tester. He's a great kid. John yeah. Tester needs to win. Sherrod Brown needs to win. I mean, two really, really tough Senate races, and we have to win both of them and have Biden win to keep the Senate. We have Tammy Baldwin on, and this is his audio just came out, that her opponent said that uh, uh, um, about nursing home residents, well, you only have a five or six month life expectancy. Almost nobody in a nursing home is in a point to vote. What? What? <laughs> oh, that's what? awesome. That's that guy, awesome. This guy is she. I, 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 the race is getting tighter. She should kick the ever living shit out of this guy. Love Tammy. Love Tammy. All right. A wow. few, uh, few bits of housekeeping before we get to uh, Senator Baldwin. Um, first, Love It or Leave It will be in Austin, Texas yeah. on April 21st. April 21st. Where Love It will be joined by Joyelle Nicole Johnson, Zach Zucker, the Sklar Brothers, and Tim Miller. Tim and Joe Miller. Rogan. 
Sorry. No, no. Couldn't get him. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't get him. Uh, Sorry. And then you're going to D.C. on April 25th for another great show with Josh Gondelman, Sam Jay, Al Franken, and Mehdi Hassan. That one's almost sold out. Wow. And Still finally, in Austin. if you're here in L.A., Pod Save America will be live at the L.A. Times Festival of Books on April 21st. Hysteria's own Aaron Ryan, Dan, Tommy, and me. We're going to have a great show. That's a wow. book burning, right? That's a book. Yeah, that is a book burning. Yeah. We'll be, bu- we'll well, be burning. Well, the tapes will be so hot, right. those books might burn. <laughs> Huh? We'll be burning our books. Yeah, so that's yeah. sort of a like a self-hating thing. <laughs> right, right. Self-preservation. Uh, you can get tickets for all of those shows. Be the Cric- books you want to burn in the world. Be- <laughs> <laughs> you can get tickets for all those shows at cricket.com slash events. Also, subscribe to Friends of the Pod. I don't know if you guys listened to the Thursday pod. Did you hear Dan do a passionate push for Friends of the Pod subscription? He said that we, are, we don't do it as well. And he was like, I'm going to do an actual endorsement wow. of signing up to subscribe to Friends of the Pod. And it was really good. As Thanks, long as you don't ask us any follow-ups, yeah, of course we did. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, old Simpsons joke. you'll get access to Polar Coaster, where Dan calms your nerves and freaks you out about the state of the polls. You can also listen to Crooked's most unhinged podcast that we'll probably get canceled for someday. It's called Ooh. Terminally Online. Mm. Don't you think Don't oh. you think that'll do it at some what point? What a welcome respite. <laughs> <laughs> it's for subscribers only, and it's where we talk about the craziest shit on the internet that week. Uh, subscribe to Friends of the Pod to listen to our exclusive pods only at crooked.com slash friends. When we come back, Wisconsin Senator Tammy Baldwin. Pod Save America is brought to you by Policy Genius. Hey, everybody needs life insurance because you it's don't know true. what's going to happen. But like, where do you find it? Yeah, where do you even do you get, get the it? Deal. Well, Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace. There we it, go. It saves you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net starting today. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just two hundred ninety-two dollars per year for one million dollars of coverage. Some options offer same-day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius helps you compare your options from top companies and their team of licensed experts is on hand to help talk you through it. Your work life insurance policy may not offer enough protection for your family's needs. Even worse, it may not come with you if you leave your job. At Policy Genius, you'll get unbiased advice from a licensed expert support team. They have no incentive to recommend one insurer over another so you can trust their guidance. Check life insurance off your to-do list in no time with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com. Joining us today, United States Senator and someone who is so pro-dairy, I took a lactate before she sat down just in case. It's Senator (laughs) Tammy Baldwin. Greetings. Good to have you back. (laughs) It's great to be back. So the Wisconsin Democratic primary was this past Tuesday, and people upset with President Biden's Gaza policy organized a push to vote uninstructed, similar to the uncommitted vote in Michigan. That ended up getting 8.3 percent. Does that worry you about Biden's path to winning Wisconsin in November? You know, one of the things I would reflect on that is these were people who voted, And they voted in the Democratic primary. Um, These are people who said, I'm fed up and I'm staying home. They sent a message. And as a message, I understand the frustration, the heartbreak that we're seeing. Um, What I hope is that um, that both their message is effective and that in November, there'll be a very clear choice, Um, you know, both to support Biden, uh, but also to uh, understand that another Trump presidency would be catastrophic, both domestically and uh, abroad. So let's, let's talk. Let's talk about that. We're we're meeting here Friday, April fifth. You said in a post that any U.S. aid to our allies must be in line with our values, and we cannot be complicit in Netanyahu's indiscriminate bombing. I should also note that in that in that tweet, you reiterated that you called for a release to all hostages and your position that Israel has a right to defend itself. But is has your position change because you supported aid in the last round in February. You did introduce an amendment about making sure humanitarian aid, or you supported an amendment about getting aid in. Uh, But does that mean you're saying there shouldn't be military aid to Israel as long as they're prosecuting the war in this this way? Are you calling for conditioning aid? Well, first of all, there are conditions already embedded in U.S. law. And uh, recently, the president did sign an executive order Uh, articulating additional conditions. What I am observing is that Netanyahu is indiscriminately bombing. Uh, Netanyahu has um, uh, charted a course that is not allowing humanitarian aid in. We've seen catastrophic loss 
of civilian uh, Gazan life, as well as aid workers, uh, as we saw horrifically this past week. And he needs to be held to account. Um, you see protests in the streets in Israel uh, demanding uh, change in course. And, um, you know, I, I support that. I also have to say that um, uh, just uh, in the last couple of days, my colleague uh, Tim Kaine uh, talked about um, uh, our support for defensive weaponry so that Israel can protect itself. Uh, but so long as we see this course of the war, that offensive weaponry uh, ought to be uh, limited. So uh, let, let's talk about the race that you're in. President Trump endorsed your opponent, Eric Laguna Beach Havdi, uh, at an event in Green Bay. He said of you, this is what Trump said, she's a very weak candidate. I mean, if you lose to her, that's not a good thing, right? Now, this is this is this is wishful thinking on Trump's part because you're an historically strong Wisconsin candidate. Uh, you won by 11 points, uh, the highest percentage achieved by a gubernatorial or senatorial candidate in Wisconsin uh, since 2006. You beat a popular former governor and cabinet official, Tommy Thompson, by five points to win the seat in the first place. And that's in a state uh, uh, where uh, four of the last six presidential elections have been decided by less than one point. But this is the first time you're running when Trump is on the ballot. Does the Does the turnout that that will entail give you any concerns, any challenges you're thinking about? There's a lot baked into that question. There so is a lot baked into that Let me start with the end of, uh, end of that question. We were just talking about the Democratic presidential primary in Wisconsin on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the Republican presidential primary. 12% um, voted for Nikki Haley, who's been out of the race for a month or so. 3% uh, I think voted for Ron DeSantis, who's been out of the race for even longer. So you got a solid 15% of Republicans participating in the Republican presidential primary who are not voting for Trump. So I don't necessarily see a completely unified front on that side. So how that will impact turnout, um, how that will impact that 15% of Republicans who just couldn't vote for Trump, even though he was really the only le candidate left standing. The, we don't know how that's going to play out right now. Um, but, you know, in terms of... Uh, of my race, I do view it fundamentally differently than I did my first race in 2012 and the midterm race that I won in 2018. Our state has gotten even more divided. You know, Trump won Wisconsin by one percentage point in 2016. Biden won by one percentage point in 2020. This is a rematch. And I don't see as many ticket splitters. So this is going to be a really tough race. And of course, the Republicans landed their hand-picked recruit, um, uh, their top recruit, um, Eric Hovde. Uh, Eric, uh, if you don't know anything about him, you know, while he was born and raised in Wisconsin, he spent his adult career either on the East Coast or the West Coast. He is president and CEO of a bank called SunWest Bank, uh, a California based uh, $2.8 billion enterprise. So he owns a bank in California. He lives uh, in Laguna Beach. He was named. Um, among the most influential business people of Orange County three years in a row. So he has a lot of uh, presence in Orange County. We don't have an Orange County in Wisconsin. We, we don't grow oranges in Wisconsin, <laughs> yeah, no. right? All right? Dairy. Dairy. Not oranges, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and so this is, um, you know, a multimillionaire who's self-funding uh, and is simply out of touch with the people um, that I fight so hard for every day in the Senate. So the, he is self-funding, and he's already up on the air with millions of dollars. Four point three so far. Four point three million dollars so far. And, uh, but you've been campaigning and and working in Wisconsin for such a long time. Uh, are you are these ads having an impact? How are you trying to blunt the impact of a candidate who can who is already promising to produce the most expensive race in the history of Wisconsin? Yeah. So uh, make no mistake, we are a pretty evenly divided state. And any Republican, a generic Republican, whatever name you want to put, <laughs> starts with about 44% of the vote. It, it could be anyone. Uh, but that's, that's what 
kind of state Wisconsin is. And then when you have somebody uh, who can put so many millions of dollars on the air and on digital digital ads, um, I, you know, their, their support only goes up. This is going to be a really tough race. And his uh, his investment right now of $4.3 million of his own wealth into TV ads and digital ads has um, increased his support. This race is kind of a dead heat right now, according to polling that I've seen. And yes, I work really hard both as a senator and on the campaign trail. One of the things that I try to do, um, you know, every every year is just get all around Wisconsin. And so I just wrapped up um, my Dairyland tour, mm-hmm. 1,400 miles on the car, and um, 19 counties, and stops with farmers and with uh, uh, owner of a brewery, a microbrewery uh, or craft brewery. Um, and uh, I started in Superior, Wisconsin. Uh, th- this is the northern, uh, northwestern part of the state in a snowstorm. They canceled the meetings we had planned because schools were closed, businesses were closed. So the first thing I did was stop and thank the snowplow drivers who made it possible for me to get there safely. That's politics. With donuts. That's po- oh, wow. That's that's it. That's how you win. <laughs> that's how you win. We, they needed a sugar high to get back out on the roads and keep us all safe. So <laughs> it actually was when I started talking about the, the turnout, what I wanted to get at is you're a lesbian progressive. I think you know that. Uh, I do. <laughs> and, I do. <laughs> but you have done and likely will do better in rural parts of your state than most Democrats could hope to perform. So what do Democrats not understand about competing in rural parts of the country? What have we lost? Yes. And I have uh, some solutions in mind, too. So I'll start by saying um, Wisconsin has had very gerrymandered maps for our state assembly and state senate. And what that has led to is that almost all the Democrats in the state legislature come from cities, some suburban areas. There are very few uh, Democrats in the state legislature who represent rural areas. Um, For me as a senator, I represent a whole state. Um, But I think the conversation with rural voters has essentially uh, been stymied by those gerrymandered maps. If you are somebody who wants to engage in public service, you live in a rural area, you look at the map and say, there's no chance a Democrat could win in this district and people don't run. So we have new maps now in Wisconsin, which is very exciting. And I really think it's going to change the conversation. If you have a real shot at um, engaging in public service, running for office, winning, representing your area, we're going to have much more diversity of districts um, uh, and people who really do understand rural issues as Democrats serving in the state legislature. So I, I do. I know that's getting kind of technical and in the weeds, but but it is, I think, going to make a fundamental shift. I make it a point to get out to my rural areas, to go to red counties and purple counties. And, you know, lots of times the people I meet with will say, I don't remember the last time we saw a U.S. senator in these parts, and especially a Democrat. I hear you on the, there's been a lot of headwinds and a lot of, you know, identity propaganda from the right to kind of turn rural parts of the country against Democrats or kind of inoculate rural parts of the country against Democrats. But it's more than just that, right? Because you see not just in in sort of, poor, you know, uh, uh, politically drawn districts, but at the state level, you'll see a state like Kansas protect abortion rights or, or a state like Utah expand Medicaid. But these are states where a Democratic policy can do well on the ballot, but a Democratic person is seen as sort of anathema in some way. And I'm wondering if, like, put aside the kind of put aside like uh, uh, the 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 districts. Is there something about how we're communicating? Right? Is there is there something that Democrats have lost in how they communicate that you think uh, is important? That's a great question. First of all, I, I want to almost respond by saying I think we don't understand as Democrats how. Republicans and conservatives and MAGA types are communicating with one another and defining Democrats. So you might show up at a place and they've been hearing, reading, being exposed to 
in many cases, misinformation, disinformation about Democrats. And if you don't understand the way they're communicating, sometimes it's challenging. But what I find, and I want to get back to the sort of rural urban issues, is when you show up, you convene, um, you know, I'm going to keep on hitting on dairy with you, but we you convene um, dairy farmers who work so hard every day and yet are challenged by uh, high input costs, low prices, and you listen and then you move uh, from listening to action and you're successful with those actions in the Congress of the United States, and then they see the difference. Word gets out, and I think that type of action and success can overcome the disinformation that people are exposed to. But I, I'm not going to pretend to understand how they're communicating, how, um, which is scary to me. I wish I did, uh, because I do think that there's a lot of... Um, uh, of myths and stereotypes put out there that before a Democrat or somebody like a candidate like me um, even engages, um, they already have preconceptions that aren't true. But you can, with hard work, break through those. I will also just say, um, you know, on, on this, I, you know, my, my opponent um, is so um, sort of unaware of the challenges that real Wisconsinites face, including uh, you know comments he's made about farmers, uh, and 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 it's just you know we have to get that word out too. Uh, let's let's talk about your opponent uh, a little bit more. Uh, so he seems pretty wishy washy on democracy. Uh, he has there's clearly an effort, just sort of politically, he wants the benefits of being embraced by and embracing Trump but doesn't want the baggage, right? So he says, oh, the election, oh, I don't think it was stolen, but there was some fishy stuff going on, right? Uh, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, he he says, oh, I don't like this kind of negative politics, but he wants Trump's endorsement. He endorses Trump, the most vicious political, uh, the personal attacking politician we've ever seen in our lifetimes. Uh, how do you make sure that he doesn't get to have it both ways? And uh, yeah, how are you talking about the relationship between Hovde and Trump and what it would mean for the kind of senator he'd be. Yeah, so it, he uh, kissed the ring this uh, uh, this past Tuesday when uh, President, former President Trump flew to Green Bay, Wisconsin and shared a stage with him and endorsed him. Uh, we now know where uh, Hovde stands with the MAGA agenda. And... We also know because he did once before run for U.S. Senate in 2012, and he didn't win the Republican primary. He came shy of defeating uh, Tommy Thompson. Uh, but he's on record. He was 100 uh, percent opposed to abortion rights. He wanted to uh, overturn the Affordable Care Act in its entirety. What he was saying about Social Security and Medicare made it very clear to me that he would never be in a position to have to rely solely on Social Security for his uh, uh, retirement um, and uh, doesn't understand the lives of people who do, who don't have a pension, who don't have savings. Um, we have to hold him to his word. Uh, you know, we've seen Trump, um, uh, you know, he lined up everything that needed to happen to overturn Roe versus Wade. It was his three justices. Uh, he wants the credit. He takes the credit every time he can. Right. And then he's saying other things. We have to hold them to their original word. They get in power again. Eric Hovde is going to vote for a national ban on abortion. I'm the champion of uh, the... Uh, Women's Health Protection Act, which would codify Roe versus Wade. I'm the lead Senate author on that. You couldn't have higher stakes in a race like this. You elect him, the Senate goes into Republican hands, they pass a national abortion ban. You reelect me and we're fighting to restore those rights just like I fought to restore um, uh, other rights threatened in the Dobbs decision, including by passing the Respect for Marriage Act. So you talked about the stakes. We the last time uh, I saw you, we were in Wisconsin during yeah. that race uh, for the Supreme Court seat, which uh, Democrats turned out and were able to win. It was a huge impact yes. on the state. 
But one of the things that uh, that you've said that Ben Wickler, the head of the Democratic Party in Wisconsin, has said is that Wisconsin has been a bellwether for what's been happening in this country. And one of the ways that that's true is uh, is this is an incredibly divided state, and we've had a, a state that's gone from. Uh, uh, that has that has Ron Johnson as one of the senators and you as the other. That's gone from Governor Scott Walker uh, to Governor Tony Evers. Like that's an incredible shift yeah. on just uh, on a tiny uh, 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 number of votes. Uh, how is this possible? Right? How is it possible <laughs> that politicians as uh, radical, extreme, ridiculous as Ron Johnson are so competitive? Uh, 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 in, in a state that Joe Biden won, in a state that may determine who the next president is. What are we missing? Is it the dairy? Is it <laughs> no. all that milk? No, it's not. Okay. So, and I, I just for a quick history snapshot, you know, I, I, I have the honor of serving in a Senate seat that was once held at the turn of the last century by fighting Bob LaFollet Sr., an icon in our state and in our country. And later, after his son served, it was McCarthy in the same seat, the same electorate, followed by Proxmire, followed by Cole, followed by me. We do have um, a, a very interesting electorate in the state of Wisconsin. Um, and it shows you how high the stakes are this time around to turning the vote out um, and, uh, and, and talking to those never Trump Republicans as well as those independents about the future of our democracy. You know, we, we talked about several of the issues that are at stake, but you said earlier, uh, you know, Trump uh, supported an insurrection and told the big lie about the outcome of the last presidential election. We cannot allow that to happen again if we cherish our democracy. You know, you talked about how you've seen ticket splitting decline. And yet, in an election this close, there are people out there that very well may be either Baldwin Trump voters or Baldwin Biden voters. There probably are going to be Baldwin Trump voters because you're probably going to outperform Joe Biden. What are those? You must meet them. You must see these I people. Do. You talk to them now. What 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 have you learned from talking to these kinds of sort of independent or true kind of ticket splitting voters in Wisconsin? Yeah. So I I, I can tell you a, top, a couple of stories. I remember. Uh, going to the groundbreaking of a, a county-owned rural hospital in Lafayette County. Uh, uh, I worked really hard to help uh, them be able to afford to replace their decrepit old hospital with a new state-of-the-art facility and brought home um, dollars, federal dollars, to help them do that. The um, one of the county board chair, or one of the county board members, with the big Trump bumper sticker on his pickup truck, um, took the microphone at this celebratory event and couldn't stop singing my praises. I was humble. I was like, and and I was repeated, and they're like, "That guy? No way! Really?" He said, "Great thing," but you know, showing up matters. Um, listening and delivering matters, and that's where you produce some of those. Trump Tammy voters. Uh, another one that I will never forget um, actually does deal with uh, substance as well as you know dollars and support. Um, I was touring a foundry. This was before the last election, and um, it's a foundry that makes things for our nation's infrastructure. Um, and so I was taking this tour, and the guy showing me around on the tour kind of points at me and says, "Why do you keep picking on my guy Trump?" <laughs> Like, what? <laughs> Why do you keep picking on my guy, Trump? Well, maybe he deserves it, I responded. He was kind of, you know, he, he didn't really crack a smile. He shows me what he does, and I move on. And one of my staff members said, okay, so you're a big Trump supporter. What do you think of Tammy Baldwin? And he said, do you see what I do for a living? I make components of our nation's infrastructure, if it were not for Buy America policies, I wouldn't have a job. This job would be in India. But Buy America policies that I champion in the United States Senate every day means that we have this really great paying union job in Wisconsin. Now, I want to make that guy into a Biden-Baldwin voter because we've never had a president who's been as good on 
uh, organized labor, first one to ever walk a picket line. My gosh. Um, so I hope we can do that. But that was a great example of a Trump Baldwin supporter back in 2018 um, that I found. And it was like, okay, sometimes it's issues. Sometimes it's listening and showing up and just I think about all the casework we do, and I, I don't want to get into the detail, but I can't tell you how many veterans we've helped get their benefits that they've earned and deserved, but were, you know, twisted up in the red tape, or how many uh, people who we helped with their social security or social security disability. Those stories are shared. Yeah, and you and do you think you can get some of those people to understand, right? Like the the people that identify with Trump. But who see you as having benefited Wisconsin? Do you think you can kind of coax them over? Like, um, that's what we're going to try to do. Get them no, over. Look, I'm, I want to run a campaign um, that is um, successful and helpful to all Democrats on the ticket, from our state assembly and state senate candidates who are now sprouting up all over the state. Now that we have a fair map, yeah, and um, you know, up through uh, the top of the ticket, and uh, I hope we can do that. So uh, I want to ask you about two more things. One is Senate's currently debating this House bill about TikTok. Yeah. You came out in support of this of the House version of the bill. The ACLU says that the bill is a violation of the First Amendment. It's also been strange to me. Like there may be very valid concerns about TikTok and its effect on privacy mm-hmm. and the fact that it has this foreign interest. But it feels as though there's been a lot of kind of classified briefings for members of Congress and senators, but not enough leveling with the American people about something that they're choosing to use. Do you think do you think the American people deserve more information mm-hmm. before any kind of bill is passed, even if the goal is to have TikTok uh, uh, sold to an American company that right. could potentially lead to a ban? Yes. So uh, the answer to the specific question is yes. And um, and let me say of the House passed bill, um, you know, I'm still studying it. I'm likely to support it. I think the goal of divesting it from uh, PRC influence and Chinese ownership is very important Mm -hmm. for uh, our data security and all sorts of... But I would have written a different bill. Um, What I think is that we do not have any sort of apparatus um, that would not just evaluate TikTok, but evaluate all sorts of devices and applications, software, um, and educate. These are the risks. Um, And uh, and then be empowered to take certain steps up to and including banning. Um, But that is, I think, a better approach because this one is so... pretty platform specific, right? Yeah. Um, but I can give you any number of examples of other products that we have in maybe our households or that, that um, we should be informed about. And uh, we don't have any uh, way of uh, voicing that. And, you know, you talked about classified briefings, and I can't disclose what I hear in classified briefings. But some of the information um, that we could gather if we put our uh, sites to it, our, 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 if, if we put our um, efforts behind it, I think would inform consumers. I like to know uh, about my products, you know, whether it's food and uh, you know, nutrients or where it comes from, or uh, in this case, um, are there risks of uh, losing my losing control of my data? Somebody being able to sur- surveil my whereabouts. Uh, you know, I don't want to uh, too much bring it back to. Uh, uh, the Dobbs decision, but there was a lot of concern uh, when this reverted to states like Texas that um, your location data could be surveilled. Mm-hmm. And if you were three hours in a Planned Parenthood parking lot, you could be prosecuted or pursued. People should know that their devices allow that to happen and uh, be educated uh, about the choices they make. Yeah, because it does. it does seem like if the goal was to get TikTok to go from being Chinese owned to American owned, then the then whatever data is being collected is still being collected. We all have kind of resigned. Right now, we have resigned ourselves to just having absolutely no idea. Absolutely. I, I want to be an educated consumer. Oh, I don't. 
<laughs> I, and, I don't want to know what's in the food. I don't want to know what the phone's collecting. I just want to live my life. Don't tell me. I don't want to know what, I don't want to see how many calories are in my sandwiches. Don't tell me. I'm trying to live. I think that you can just pass up on that information, okay. but I'm going to look at it. All right, great. Fine. I think that's fine. Now, speaking of giving consumers information, you've introduced a bill and called on the FDA to make sure non-dairy milks don't get to gallivant around town wearing the milk label, that you think the milk label belongs on dairy products, not whatever they're squeezing out of almonds and soybeans. What should we call what they're squeezing out of almonds and soybeans? Well, we could even do a contest around that. Mm. I think almond beverage sounds great. Almond beverage? Almond juice? Almond juice. That would be okay. There's So there's not a statutory definition of beverage or juice. Mm. There is a statutory definition of milk. Of milk. And it comes from an animal that lactates. So that so goats, that counts. Yes, you can say goat milk. We can still say goat milk, everybody. And cow milk, but none yeah. of this almond milk. That would be my uh, preference that the FDA actually enforce the law that they are required to enforce. I think, I'm kind of with that. They're I do declining. Think... They're declining to do so right now, which is very frustrating to my farmers. So, so... <sighs> You know, the, the use of the name actually has a, a serious impact on, on their business. There's a lot of consumers, again, you don't need to have knowledge about what you consume if you don't want to. Yeah, I'm a but, low information consumer, um, yeah. But, uh, but what I would say is, you know, there's not, it's not a nutritional equivalence. And if you just like hear that, say, almond milk is, um, is better for you because it's plant-based, um, you know, children need calcium. Babies need um, nutrients that milk provides. Don't su don't suggest that uh, that this is a, a nutritional equivalent by using you know dairy names. Um, so Our, yeah. yeah, Wisconsin's culture is not your costume. Almonds is that what you're saying? <laughs> Yeah, that's but right. But I'm, I'm getting, not for getting some, getting just, some, getting some looks. Okay. I was gonna say, but we're, you know, we were just talking about TikTok. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about banning almond beverage. No, no, no one's just, saying you are. Right. You just want to label it differently. <laughs> I think juice. I think we have to face the fact that just because it's milk, milk, uh, in its appearance, it's just juice. Because you mm -hmm. get it the same way you get juice, don't you? You squeeze. I don't know what they do to make almond milk. Some what 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 <laughs> There's terrible... some great YouTube videos oh. about how. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll let you know the link okay. later. Okay. Now, <laughs> last question. Uh, you're gay. We talked about that earlier. Uh, let me ask you this. And you may not have an answer. Muna or Boy Genius? <laughs> I don't have an answer. Okay. So Muna and Boy Genius are uh, two uh, uh, groups. That they're both uh, have uh, three uh, uh, members. They are a mix of... Uh, bisexual and uh, queer performers. I like, I'm a Muna person. I'm a Muna person. Um, you're boy genius. You're boy genius. But they're just. So can I tell you that my era, it would be Elton John or Queen? For sure. And what would you have chosen? Elton John. Okay. I think, and I think that's fine. Both of the movies, the biopics came out like right about the same time. And um, I, I found them both very fascinating. But yeah, that's my, you know, in my high school, uh, uh, you know, basketball games, when I'm in the stand, it was, you know, we are the champions and I will rock you. So, that you know. I, I, I have Elton John phases and I have Queen phases. I, I absolutely love both. I will see neither of those movies for very simple reasons. I do not like movies about artists making art because it always ends up with somebody going like, what kind of rhapsody should it be? <laughs> what kind of rhapsody? Bohemian rhapsody. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't want to know how this was made. I don't want to see how the sausage is made. You know? Okay. What, what are your thoughts on Renee Rapp? Oh, gosh. You're going to show how... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is what, this is, listen, I think, look, these coastal elites, already, they know about Renee Rapp. They know about Muna and Boy Genius, not the hard scrabble, milk chugging. You're too busy. You're too busy under a cow doing this to know what Muna is. <laughs> I think the answer is yes. And that's really, you're supposed to brief me before this interview. No, that, this is part of the fun. Uh, Senator okay. Tammy Baldwin, thank you so much for your time. Thank and, you. And uh, what can people do to uh, uh, help in the campaign right now? Go to TammyBaldwin.com. Um, there's all sorts of uh, opportunities there. So obviously people can give, people can volunteer. Um, we even have a toolkit on how people can amplify the message online. 
using all sorts of social media, including TikTok. Including so, TikTok. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot people can do to help. All right. Senator, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to Tammy Baldwin for joining us today. And uh, we'll have another episode for you on Wednesday.